Hey, it's Kim McKay, and thank you, because the new season is finally here. Now, personally myself, it wasn't an amazing episode, not much happened, there wasn't a huge amount of fight scenes or anything like that, but it was very informative and it gave us a lot of information and kind of setting up what's going to be seen for Season 5. And it still had this pretty cool few scenes that I really like myself, mainly just for the cinematography and the way they've done it really good. Now, I know a lot of GOT YouTubers just, like, absolutely find no flaws in Game of Thrones and have no criticism for it every episode ever. But I'm not like that. If I don't like it, I will say that I do not like that. If they do something I really like, then I will say uh, I really like that. Just because Game of Thrones has done amazing seasons in the past doesn't mean the season is automatically going to be amazing. I personally, I saw from the trailer and stuff, it looks really awesome. It's going to get really hype real fast. And that's what I've seen. But if they don't prove that to me, then I won't give them that straight away. Now, before I go ranting about something that's completely unimportant, I will get right into the review and the first scene. Now the episode starts off with a flashback, which if you are a book reader, you know we've been waiting for so long. They really needed more flashbacks, and uh, after the performance they did for this one, which was absolutely amazing, I'm surprised they didn't do more flashbacks. I'm not saying the scene was perfect, there was a few minor issues with it, but as a whole, that flashback was absolutely amazing, and I really like the way that now Williams portrayed the young Cersei, it was really well done. So we started the episode off with young Cersei and her friend walking to Maggie the Frog's hut through the woods. Now the interaction between the friend and Cersei was very well done, exactly like how I pictured it in the books, the way that she was really scared and pulled back, and that kind of authority that the young Cersei had, as she knows that she's powerful, she's lord, and she's close to her lands, she's really important, everyone has to bow down to her. Now one of the small issues I had with the scene was Maggie the Frog herself. Like I was expecting some like wood witch, like witch doctor kind of thing that was like really, like really, really augmented with loads of like piercings of like that really ugly like thing. I wanted to see like a more inhuman like feeling, like a really magical like this. This being is not really human; it's more of a creature in a human like form. But to me, she just looked like a regular woman, like you know, decently attractive, not really that bad off, you know probably could just see her around town, not in that kind of clothing, but generally just a normal person. It's not a really big issue, but it was just something I had in the scene, you know, just kind of something that would really bug me. So this was a pretty good scene, and I quite like the dialogue between Maggie the Frog and Cersei and how they portrayed it. It's very accurate to, like, what the kind of books did. Not exactly the wording, but how the feeling was, the tension between her, and, like, she's very powerful, and Maggie the Frog is, like, this unrelaxing, uncaring of her authority kind of person. You could see that the Maggie the Frog wasn't really scared at all of her power or her father or anything like that. She's dealt with people so much more worse and with things, not just people, just creatures of darkness and terror. So young Cersei asks three questions to Maggie the Frog. So to start off with, Cersei says that she has promised to the prince Ty Rhaegar Targaryen because the Targaryen is still in power at that point. Then she asks Maggie if she will be married to the prince. Maggie replies with no, but you will marry the king, which she assumes at the point is the Targaryen king, which is a bit strange to her, but she still likes the idea of being queen. Remember, Cersei, unlike Jaime and Tyrion, are always looking for power. She's always, in her entire life, wanted to be more than she is now. Like, she's always been up there, but always cast aside as like a side citizen. Even though she was an uh, upper-class citizen with all this power and stuff, she still was a woman, and she couldn't reach these peaks. So she wanted to be the most powerful as she could be from her position. Then she asks, will she be queen? And she says, yes, until another queen comes, younger, more beautiful, to cast her down and take everything she holds dear. Now, if we look at the current events of the show right now, Marguerite fits quite a lot of the tick boxes of that prediction. She's younger, some say more beautiful, plus she's taking Tommen away, which is everything she holds dear at that point. This question is one I think is the main driving point for hatred at Marjorie straight away, and this is what makes her so paranoid and get crazy and crazy, hyped up and very dangerous in the situation she's in right now. Now at this point, she's probably not entirely believing what she's saying, but we see now for the next question, when she asks if they will have children, she says, no, you will have three and the king will have twenty. As you may have noticed at the moment, a lot of these predictions came true. She did marry the king. She did have three children. Robert did have 20. And this is making her very, very paranoid about Marjorie and her taking everything she holds dear. Do you remember that scene with Samuel Tarly and Jon Snow on the wall where Sam explains his whole backstory and how he ended up being to the Night's Watch? To me, this is what this flashback does for Cersei. It explains why she is like she is today and why she has these hatreds and stuff. It kind of makes her make sense for what she's doing right now. And that's why I thought this opening was absolutely amazing. So we move right along to present day where Tywin is sadly dead, leaving both the twins completely out of luck with their father and absolutely on their own. 
if you think about it, Tywin was kind of like the glue that held everything together, not just the Lannister house, but the whole entire kingdom. He was so feared, so revered, so respected that no one would cross him. He was that safety net that they always could rely on, and now he's gone and they're all completely vulnerable to everything that's going to happen. With the information we get from the flashback, plus this information, you can see why Cersei is really pissed with Jaime for like halfway causing the death of their father. With the death of Tywin, she feels more and more pressure that she's completely responsible for protecting her child and stopping the prophecy that Megan the Frog said from coming true. Now Cersei ends this scene by saying that Jaime was always the golden child, as he was referred to. And it's very true, Jaime was always supposed to take over Tywin's legacy and carry on the Lannister name. And now he's just some glorified king's guard that just protects, you know, the king pretty poorly at this rate. He's killed one and let another, you know, two die and right in front of him, so you know. Previously in the book series and the other seasons, Cersei was very reliant as a child for S Jamie's protection. She always could rely on Jamie. Jamie would always be there to comfort her, stop her enemies and those kind of things. And now she's feeling that she can't rely on him anymore and the pressure's going on even more and more and then that's what's driving her down the circle that will never end. Personally, I thought the scene was very well done. The mood and the whole way it was set out was extremely well. It gave you that real sense of this is exactly how I expected this to happen. Like, they've just lost some of the most greatest power they had, a great person in their life, someone that they really cared about and that was always helping them throughout their lives. Of course, they had their problems with Tywin. He was very bossy. He wanted to rule the whole house and stuff like that. And they had their childhood of squabbles. But he was the backbone, the protection that they needed. They were his father. And no matter what they say, they loved him. And and now they don't have Tywin anymore, they really feel like they're all alone, and they are. And that's what's going to make things really interesting this season. Now we move on to everyone's favourite leprechaun, Tyrion Lannister. The opening shot was with him in the barrel, and him falling out, which he seems to be there crammed in there for quite a long time, which is probably very uncomfortable for him, but, you know, he's safe, he's out of Westeros, and Cersei can't get his hands on him anymore, so I think he's better off than he was before. And it seems they've arrived at Lero's palace in Pentos. If you forgot who Lyria was, he's the person that helped Danny get sold to Drogo in the very beginning of Season 1. Plus he's an ally of Varys, if you remember when um, Arya was chasing cats down in the dungeons with the dragon heads, he remember you could see Varys and him talking in those dungeons. That was him, and that's why he's an ally with um, Varys. In the books you get more backstory of how they really met and how they became friends and stuff like that. In the show I don't think they're going to cover that. They may briefly, but I don't think they will. It's not really unimportant for kind of the story and the flow it's going in, so I'd, I doubt they did, would do it. What I love about this scene is that you finally get to see the side that Varys is on. He always says he's about the realm or he's about the people and all that kind of stuff, but now you truly find where his loyalties lie. So we kind of had some small suspicions in the beginning from what Arya's seen and stuff like that, that he was supporting the Targaryens, but we hadn't had true confirmation that that's exactly what he was trying to do, because we hadn't seen any intervention between him and Danny yet. Now if you read the books, you know this is a little bit more different and Tyrion goes a different path, but obviously they're cutting out their character as we knew before season 5 was going to be released, from information stuff like that, but obviously he's going to just go straight to Danny and try to see if that storyline goes on, or they could be passing the entire storyline of that other character to Danny straight away, like they have done with several other characters in the past, because they don't want to cast new people. What I love about this scene is Tyrion's reaction to the proposal of helping out Danny and stuff like that. He can't let that, that look when he looks up, he's like, you want me to do what? As much as I like the storyline in the books, I still really look forward to this Tyrion storyline in the show. It looks like it's going to be already a lot more faster, and so we're going to see a lot more action and a lot more cool ass stuff that happens in Season 5. Now, me being a book reader, I knew quite a lot that the Song of the Harveys would come in really quickly into Game of Thrones Season 5. But even I was super surprised when that knife just slit across his throat. I was not expecting that at all. When the scene started off, I thought the entire scene was just to kind of like show what could be happening later on with um, Grey Women and stuff like that, so her, his relationship with um, the Sandy, so I actually thought that there was like a foreshadowing for that to show that coming through, but then they also then used it for an even better purpose of showing the Sons of the Harpy. So Sir Barristan kind of explains the Sons of Harpies a little bit to, when he's talking to Daenerys, but not that much at all. But don't worry, there'll be a lot more explanations for that later on in the season, I expect, because they're going to be not doing much in Marine. They, all they're going to do is sit around and talk anyway, so you know. Now the dialogue between Mother Sandra and Jon Snow, I've been looking forward for the, the entire season. Ever since the end of season 4, when Mother Sandra gave that longing look through the flames at Jon Snow, I knew this shit was going to come. Now I love the way that they portrayed this entire scene, it was absolutely amazing. The like half awkwardness, half like longingness, the half like tension, it was really amazing. 
So again, straight to the point, um, Jon Snow meets up with um, Stannis Baratheon and the Onion Knight. Stannis offers him a deal where if he can convince the uh, wildlings to join his army, he'll give them some land he, and um, let them be citizens of the realm. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what they were trying to do when they were crossing the wall. They knew that when the state gets past the wall, they're going to have to fight some people to, you know, keep their stay or, like, not get killed off by the lords in that area. But now they're getting opportunity from Stannis to be able to fight the Balkans instead of just some other random person, and then they get their land and they become citizens of the realm and everything like that. It's kind of the perfect deal in the eyes. But of course, fucking Mance just ruins the entire thing by like, nah, my pride is not the reason, but it's probably the pride. Let's, let's be understand. You've got the perfect deal here, okay? And all you have to do is stop doing exactly what you said you wouldn't do, and then everyone will be saved. But no, 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 you can't do that. You've just built so much of your life not doing that, and now you can't do it. I really thought that um, the character Mance Rayner was above this, and like in the books, he seemed a lot more, it was a lot more different in the books, so it was understandable what his decision he made by that, but for this, it just seems absolutely stupid what he's doing, it doesn't seem like his character would do that, he may have like had a few troubles like that, but this does not seem like him. As much as I love the interaction between Mance Rayner and Jon Snow, and Jon Snow and Stannis, it's pretty cool and all that stuff, but I really just hate the decision he made. I wish they just chose the Wildlings. They had the perfect opportunity to do exactly what they were aiming to do when they crossed the wall, but he turns it down and dies in a fire for it. And now the episode takes us to Batar Baelish, and his lovely assistant, Sansa Stark, or otherwise known as Darth Sansa, or my favourite, my wife. We don't see a lot with Sansa and Peter Baelish, they're much a few talk scenes within the carriage and stuff. The main thing that they will kind of see is um Robin getting handed down to one of the lords to be trained and kind of looked after while they roam to where they're going. I did say in a previous video that for the evidence suggested that they were going to Winterfell, but we don't know it for sure yet, but we'll just have to find out from the show. But it looks pretty likely that they're gonna go there because they wanna kind of claim Sansa's either, you know, position to Winterfell so that he can get more lands and more control, or just to, you know, check out whatever they're going to do, or stop the Boltons from something like that. Most likely to try and force Sansa's claim. Personally, I thought that it was going to be a little bit bigger thing with Robin's storyline in the show than they actually showed, but I'm not that too worried. He was a very important character. He was just kind of a little annoying kid in season one, so hopefully there won't be much more of him because he wasn't really important. I'd like them to accelerate other, you know, storylines instead of just wasting their time on Robin, which is pretty good. There was another small exchange between Lancel Lannister and uh, Cersei with him talking about his time with Cersei and trying to get her forgiveness as he joined a new or like faith organization called the Sparrows. This scene is kind of interesting because it kind of shows the background and gives some like conversion to the ideas that we had previously about him being a hand in Robert's death. We kind of thought it because of some of the things that Varys said in season one, but we never had confirmed kind of proof from the actual characters himself until this point. I believe that they're just kind of using Lancel as like a foreshadowing for a lot of the things that are going to happen with the Sparrows, the High Sparrow, and a whole bunch of other kind of stuff that we're going to see throughout the season. There's going to be quite a lot of tension between the High Lords and the common people, because they're the ones that are going to be really feeling the hurt from all this war and battle and famine and all the stuff that the High Lords are playing. To wrap up this review, we move back to Denny. To start off the scene, we have her on the partial-like throne, doing errands like she did for half of Season 4, and it's... um. It's not very uh, productive, it's mainly just his dar again trying to reopen the fighting pits and if um, Dario reporting back from his missions and stuff like that. But then it gets pretty interesting when they goes to bed and Dario is con trying to convince Danny to reopen the fighting pits. Now there's nothing more convincing than in a good night out, but obviously she's not buying it at first, but with Dario's charm and backstory, he manages to convince her otherwise. In my point of view, there's two Darios. There's the book Darios and the show Darios. The book Darius is annoying, it's in the way, controlling of da da Daenerys, you know, manipulative and untrusting worthy. And then we have the show de Dario, which is cunning, smart, witty, cool comments and pretty and hilarious, and his backstory is not half bad. I quite like it, that character. So personally myself, I like the show what they've done with the character. They make them actually interesting and you want them to stay together as a couple and you feel like they're going to work. But in the books, I really don't think so. I won't cover a lot of the big scenes that I thought was really awesome for this review, because I'm going to make a top 5 moments just after this one, maybe release it tomorrow, so you guys won't be able to watch that. Plus, I'm trying to think of doing a Q&A, so I've got a, enough videos, uh, questions at the moment to make a small Q&A. If you guys post more questions in the comment section below, I'll be able to make a longer one with a few more answers, and, um, you know, go a few more variations, so you guys can answer some questions you guys actually want. So make sure to either answer, qu ask questions in the comment section below, or go into my Twitter at TWKeemK. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.